Coming up on today's episode, have we found the perfect home theater PC remote? We're going to need a bigger HDTV room size versus screen size. VLC goes HD, NASCAR in 3D, the top five 80s movies in Blu-ray, and the Blu-ray releases for the week of June 29, 2010. This is HD Nation. Today's episode is brought to you by Gamefly. Get a two-week free trial at Gamefly.com slash HDNation. Netflix. Go to Netflix.com slash HDNation for your free trial membership. And GoDaddy.com. Is it time? It is. Is it hey. time? <laughs> it is. <laughs> Welcome to HD Nation. I'm Robert Aaron. And I'm Patrick Norton. HD Nation is your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. Blu-ray, online, satellite, cable, over the air. If it is in HD, we like it. Are you ready for some exciting news? Always. VLC, a.k.a. the Video Land Client, a.k.a. one of the best open source media players around for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Seriously, folks, it's a Swiss army knife for media files, especially on scratch disks. They've stepped things up with the release of version 1.1.0. Check this out. GPU decoding on Windows Vista and Windows 7 using DXVA2 for H.264, VC1, and MPEG2. GPU decoding on GNU and Linux. And, well, okay, I got to say, for the Mac folks, no OS X uh, hardware acceleration for video. Wah, Sorry. Wah, wah, wah. But improved support for MKVHD files, including seeking fixes, 7.1 channel codecs, and actually support for Blu-ray subtitles, which nice. I thought was really interesting. MPEG4 lossless, VP8, a ton of audio codecs. And actually, on the other side, integrated playlists, multiple views, and quite a bit more. Free, open source. I haven't tried seeing it, if it'll play a Blu-ray yet. So I, I found out about this morning. We'll, we'll this play the Blu-ray disc. We'll play the Blu-ray disc. But it'll play those files yet. that are on the disc if you can do your manipulations mm. to move those files off of that disc or access them somehow. Anyway, but so far on Windows for GPU decoding, Video LAN is recommending NVIDIA's hardware until ATI drivers are basically stepped up to work with the VLC architecture and until the VLC developers get access to some Intel hardware, basically, for supporting their GPU decoding as well. Right. Now, I know that ATI and NVIDIA both released some big driver updates in the last week. So I'm hoping that, and they both specifically mentioned video decoding and video acceleration as part of those driver updates. I'm hoping this also means that ATI is finally catching up with their drivers <laughs> by the end of the, well, by, by the end now. of this month. Right. Now. Let's yeah. hope they get that integrated. And we should point out that's <clears> a strong, strong piece of advice there. If you're running a home theater PC at home, update your driver's fee if things get better. NASCAR, dude. Da -na 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 NASCAR. Watch this facial expression. <laughs> NASCAR is going 3D. <laughs> for at least one race, the Coke Zero Four Hundred. Oh, cool. The Coke Zero Four Hundred. Coke Zero, baby. Coke Zero. Coke Zero. What? what, what zero was calories, this? zero something or another. Yeah, I'm not even gonna go there. <laughs> sponsorship is sponsorship. This isn't like the Daytona, though. No, the Daytona no, Five Hundred is the like, big race. They do about three races a year, I believe, at Daytona. So this will be, I think, this is the third. Okay. Or the second. In any case, they're did at the Five Hundred. So. <laughs> Turner <laughs> Sports will be the first network to air a NASCAR race in 3D following Major League Soccer. Uh, the Masters tournament for the golfing fans out there, and a single hockey game earlier this year. FIFA! Yeah. <laughs> NASCAR told television broadcast the broadcast, quote, will feature two custom racing feeds produced specifically for 3D. The first one will provide a unique look at the racing action from a strategically placed cameras around the track designed to maximize the effect of 3D. The second stream will bring the mayhem of pit row into the third dimension, creating a one-of-a-kind visual experience. That's awesome. Yeah. Pit Row is where it really gets crazy. And you could, they do these long shots down Pit Row, mm -hmm. and I could see where the 3D effect will really go. That would be something pretty visual, I would imagine, when that's going on. So yeah. I'm excited. Big old pneumatic lug wrench coming towards your face or I'm something. I'm excited. I have to also mention, too, if, if, you, if you can't watch these shows, TNT's website, the NASCAR website, and they're mm -hmm. currently they're broadcasting the NASCAR Cup Series on TNT, there is a special version of TNT's Race Buddy. Now, this is their web app, basically, that lets you watch the, the races on your computer. You'll be able to watch it in 3D, which will require a Microsoft Silverlight Player and NVIDIA's 3D Vision Kit if you're on a computer. But I've got to say that uh, if you're a fan, just check it out anyway. Right. I ran the Mosaic View. This is where you get a, a quad split screen in whatever resolution you can spit out. I was putting this onto a second display while watching the race, and it was basically commercial-free audio. <laughs> <laughs> and it was more real time than the actual broadcast was. It was closer to real time. So I, I basically had two TVs going at once with 
arguably five camera shots, and, and it was just, it really made the race. And it was, and, it, and there's some other customizable stuff too you can take a look at. But. Your living room is starting to look like Mission Control. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, I'm just like, I pull the projector out and point the projector at a screen, and then I got the TV running. But I think Race Buddy's epic. I wish, I wish, I wish this would continue after it leaves TNT mm -hmm. in another four or five races, but maybe it will. That would be nice. CNET says Western Digital has shipped the MyBook AV DVR Expander. Huh? It's a one terabyte drive, it includes ESAN and USB ports, but beyond that, it's a MyBook. It's certified to work with a laundry list of TiVo, DirecTV, and Time Warner Boxing. Oddly enough, I actually just swapped a two terabyte drive uh, into an older MyBook that had ESAT of ports on it. Essentially, it's, it's just a, if you're nervous about whether or not a, a hard drive, external hard drive will work with your DirecTV or TiVo box, this is a way to, to get one. But the truth is, two terabyte drives are just hitting the floor in prices. I would probably uh, just buy a two terabyte uh, Western Digital drive and put it in a cheaper external case. I'm already waiting for four terabyte drives to upgrade my NAS yet again. Three terabytes <sighs> later this year. Three terabytes possibly by I November. To, I need to hold off until the fours arrive. <laughs> <laughs> I need more, That'll be more storage. 2011. Or I just need to build a bigger NAS box. Anyway. Vizio has new toys. They have a new sound bar, including a model with wireless surround speakers, the VHP 100 wireless home theater headphones, Mr. Tiny Apartment should test those, a dual band 802.11n router to feed Vizio internet apps, their new dual band wireless Blu-ray players, and five new LED LCD HD TVs from 22 to 55 inches, some with wireless Vizio internet apps as well, and new 480 hertz true LED 3D models in their premium XVT lineup. Mm. Reviews will be coming for everything we can get our hands on. I know we're gonna be checking out the internet apps for a lot of TVs in the upcoming episodes too. We've put in plenty of hardware requests. Yeah, they actually have a stack of cheap Blu-ray players now. The router's kind of a funny thing, but it's like, you don't necessarily need a Vizio router to work with your Vizio HDTV and your Vizio internet apps, but obviously Vizio is ready to just have people grab giant piles of Vizio branded products. That, I'm curious, is that the router with the HDMI ports in it though? So you can just plug your devices in and then stream that right to the TV wirelessly? You no, know, I mm. couldn't tell that from the press release. I know, we gotta get this hardware in our hands, people. Quickly. Yes. Time for a question? Let's do it. All right. Hollywood is happily converting all our beloved old movies over to Blu-ray so we can all buy them again. My question is, are we really getting better picture quality? New movies created with modern HD tech make awesome HD Blu-rays, but how can old movies claim HD? The older movies were never HD in the first place, or were they? If I already have the movies on a DVD, would I be gaining anything noticeable by upgrading to Blu-ray? Love the show. Paul in Nashua, New Hampshire. Okay, first of all, all cinematic movies, all movies made for the cinema, everything shot on film, or are actually digital now, they're all HD. They all effectively have all the information you need to create an HD signal. They're just not necessarily all widescreen, no, especially no. With the older stuff. The original format was a four by three right. format, 133 to one. Yeah. So that, that was not a widescreen format, but the detail that's possible out of film to be transferred digitally yeah. into, into a digital format it, it, it can easily be HD. It can far exceed what we currently think of as HD in the home. Yeah, it's so funny. It's like, you know, you have film as a piece of plastic. Earlier, it was a piece of highly flammable material, the name of which I can't remember, but there's silver, basically, there's little tiny pieces of silver that capture the light and record the information on there. There's thousands of them per square inch, right? And probably tens of thousands. The math is a little fuzzy for me at this now, point. Now, the latest hardware from companies like Ari, who do lighting systems, mm -hmm. as well as film scanners, those have taken dramatic jumps in quality and in capability capability as far as taking film and being able to scan that and digitize it, much like you would do with a scanner and film strips right. of uh, photograph quality. But the new tools are actually allowing them to do cleaning on the fly, like dust removal, speck removal, scratch removal, and things like that at decent quality rates while they make that transfer to an HD format. Archiving purposes, really, yeah, is what they're looking at. Yeah, and, and archiving or just, look, that's right there, basically, telecine, the transfer from the film stock uh, to the digital file format, the quality of the original film stock. You look at something like The Wizard of Oz, 8K, 8K transfer, which is a ridiculously high resolution of scan, manually, basically corrected. They took each individual frame off of the three strips of, uh, film that were used to create the original negative, right? They bond those all together in the computer, they cleaned up all the scratches, the marks, then they color corrected everything and you have this insane vision that was probably as good or better than the original prints released back in the 30s. That is the benchmark, something like that, fantastic. The new version of Casablanca looks fantastic. It's four by three, it's black and white. It was gorgeous, the level of detail in the faces. Ingrid Bergman, 
looks great in like crappy old UHF broadcast. She looks amazing but on Blu-ray. Going that back to the question though, it, it is difficult to tell just when I'm going through my right. value bin at my local store of all the <laughs> Blu-ray titles that are there, which of those titles has received the, the AAA grade treatment and which have just been simply, we scan the film with probably a scanner from five years ago or something, and or, how, how or good will worse, that look? Or worse, what a lot of people pointed out, a lot of 80s films, like Our Youth, right? We're gonna talk about 80s films later. A lot of them <laughs> have basically been grabbed. They took the DVD file and they blow it up. They scale it up for a Blu-ray in the worst possible scenario. I haven't seen too many like that, though. Yeah. But there's, there's, there's a bunch of ones that are, maybe they haven't scaled the DVD file up, but they've used the same DVD, the, basically the scan they did five or ten years ago for the DVD. And I've seen the same artifacts in a DVD that you, that in the same, when it gets transferred to Blu-ray, you'll yeah. get that as well. So I find in general, Blu-ray is always going to look better compared to the DVD for a couple of reasons. One, the aspect ratio is always going to be correct, or at least the original aspect ratio of the film, hopefully. In most cases, that's the truth. But... The other thing too is that it's just the resolution of the of the of the of the material itself. It, it it's better than usually you'll get out of right. you know what I don't even know if I want to say that out loud. Here, here. <laughs> I, gotta, I, gotta I keep thinking I, I want to say it's gonna be better than an upscale version, to but you. no 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 no. Do yourself a favor. Go to high def you know disc news. You know go to, to go to high def digest. Go to the Blu-ray review sites. Read their review of the films because they're gonna tell you oh this is the same crappy transfer from HD or oh my goodness the colors are off on this or oh my goodness this looks amazing because they completely rescanned it because. It really depends on the studio and how much time and money they're willing to put into the film. And in some cases, right, The Godfather, I was talking to people about this on Twitter, you know, Coppola decided he wanted to brighten the look of the film up a little bit. So a lot of people are freaked out when they see The Godfather where everything's a little lighter than it has ever been before. So read the, read the reviews before you buy. That'll help you out a lot with avoiding ugly Blu-ray discs. That's another reason I also get so excited about things like Criterion Collection editions mm -hmm. when they're released on Blu-ray format. You know that companies like that, and there's some other good groups out there too doing similar restoration work. You know that they're taking the best quality source material right. they get their hands on and putting that onto the Blu-ray disc. That's really what we're looking for when we go to buy these discs anyway. And going forward, it's only going to get better. But we are kind of at that transition point right now where hopefully everyone's switching over to 8K scanning, better better cleanup, automated cleanup functions for the movies that won't get the AAA treatment mm -hmm. like Wizard of Oz. Right. But, and hopefully going forward, it will just, like I said, continue to get uh, better. I want the third man on Blu-ray. Mm. Criterion, are you listening? Mm. Hey, let's thank one of our sponsors. I want to let you in on an inside scoop, everybody. VeriSign, that's a registry for .com and .net domains. They're raising their prices July 1st. That means the standard 749.com offer from GoDaddy, that's going up too. So if you want to beat the price increase, you need to act now. Just use promo code HCN10 when you check out. You're going to score a discount, people. Remember, prices on .com and .net domains are going up July 1st. So head on over to GoDaddy.com and grab your domain now. And be sure to check out Revision3.com slash GoDaddy. You'll find a list of all the amazing GoDaddy deals from Revision3. There's a slew of 80s remake hitting theaters this summer, basically mining our childhood for the profit of Hollywood, some <laughs> more egregiously awful than others. This has inspired the entire HD nation to dedicate this week's top five list to the top five iconic movies from the 80s on Blu-ray. So yeah. before anybody, and I'm gonna say this to you, like you're gonna be emailing me, you'll call me up and yell on the phone. Before you email about your favorite 80s movies not being on this list, remember people, check to see if it's actually available on Blu-ray. Uh, then email us, okay? Uh, Just disclaimers. Saying. Just say Asterisk. Picture people winner. get passionate about the 80s. Uh, understood. Now, <laughs> movies that people will instantly recognize as coming from the decade of Reaganomics, The Cold War, and Flock of Seagulls. So without further ado, here is our list. St. Elmo's Fire, a Joel Schumacher movie centering on the trials and tribulations of a group of friends who must transition from their cocoon self-centered college lives into the less forgiving world of adulthood. Featuring such 80s icons as Judd Nelson, Demi Moore, Rob Lowe, Emilio Estevez, Andrew McCarthy, and Ali Sheedy. Proto yuppies. Next up, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, an excellent Blu-ray transfer, I may add. The movie that turned playing hooky into an art form, Matthew Broderick stars as Ferris Bueller, the ultimate high school wise guy, determined to have a day off from school despite the attempts of the high school principal, while dragging his fellow students played by Mia Sara and Ellen Ruck along for the ride. Heathers, speaking of high schools, Heathers is the ultimate teen click movie, featuring a super young Christian Slater and Winona Ryder as two student rebels seeking to overthrow the oppressive popular kids and their social order at their local high school. 
Ghostbusters. Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Harold Ramis star as the titular paranormal investigators who, after getting kicked out of the university, turn their far-fetched ideas about the supernatural into the ultimate startup. Trading Places, a classic life swap tale. This movie centers on a bet between two bored and wealthy brothers who decide to switch the lives of a streetwise con man played by Eddie Murphy and a successful stockbroker played by Dan Aykroyd to determine what truly makes a man successful in life. Laughs abound in this satiric tale of life, money, and the pursuit of happiness. Another personal favorite of mine, Robocop, starring Peter Weller and Kurtwood Smith and directed by Paul Verhoeven, one of, them, one of my favorite directors. <laughs> this seminal work explores the dystopian world where violence and greed are rewarded and honesty, integrity, are scorned. Oh, and it has a cop who gets shot up and is reborn as a cyborg to seek revenge on the murderous scum who killed him. Enough said. Top Gun, and this is the movie that made Tom Cruise the ultimate 80s heartthrob. It tells the tale of a cocky naval fighter pilot who is sent to the Navy's weapons training school to learn the skills of air combat from the best of the best. Along the way, he must overcome a personal tragedy mm -hmm, and self-doubt to beat the Ruskies. Friday the 13th. This horror slash slasher slash unstoppable evil flick centers on a couple of camp counselors as they experience the deadly rage of Jason Voorhees as they attempt to restart the camp at Camp Crystal Lake. And if we were making this list three months in the future, we'd include The Breakfast Club. But the 25th anniversary Blu-ray isn't scheduled for release until August 3rd. Mm, we'll be talking about that soon. It's time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of June 29th, 2010. First up, Hot Tub Time Machine, starring John Cusack and Rob Corddry. With a small role from Crispin Glover, this fun yet ridiculous flick tells the story of four friends who get to relive the 80s via, you guessed it, a hot tub that just happens to be a time machine. It's not the most subtle or insightful film out there, but it's definitely a good time, especially if you remember the 80s yourself. Extras include deleted scenes, and this release also includes a digital copy. Next we have Predator, Ultimate Hunter Edition, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jesse Ventura. This 1987 flick has all the hardcore alien hunting and killing you could ask for. It features an all-new digital restoration on this two-disc release, along with extras such as two behind-the-scenes featurettes titled If It Bleeds, We Can Kill It and Inside the Predator, as well as deleted scenes, outtakes, and a special effects featurette. You'll also be treated to a sneak peek at Predators, the upcoming third movie in the franchise releasing in theaters next week. Also released this week, because it's always fun to have a campy zombie movie in the lineup, Uncle Sam. Just when you thought it was safe to stand up and salute the flag, Uncle Sam is back with a vengeance. A Desert Storm veteran, known to his nephew as Uncle Sam, killed in battle, rises from the grave on the 4th of July to get even with any unpatriotic citizen in town. Draft dodgers, tax cheats, flag burners, watch out. Uncle Sam is coming for you. Extras include deleted scenes, a gag reel, fire stunts with audio commentary from the stunt coordinator, and more. If you're looking for a campy zombie flick like you've never seen, check out Uncle Sam. Other releases include 2010's The Crazies, Don McKay, 2009's The Eclipse, The Criterion Collection's Everlasting Moments, the BBC's How the Earth Changed History, The Criterion Collection's The Leopard, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief, Stolen, 2007's Warlords, 2009's The White Ribbon, Black Sabbath Paranoid, Kill Switch, When You're Strange, a film about the doors, and Wicked Lake, director's cut. It's time to thank one of our sponsors, Netflix. With more than 12 million members, Netflix is the world's largest subscription service, streaming movies and TV episodes over the internet and sending DVDs by mail. This week, I'm finally getting around to watching the first installment of the comic book action trilogy, Spider-Man. Yeah, I know it's been eight years since this movie debuted in theaters. Well, it's been climbing my Netflix movie queue for the last six months, and it's time I check Spidey off my list. For $8.99 a month, Netflix members can instantly watch unlimited TV episodes and movies streamed to their TVs and computers, and can receive unlimited DVDs delivered quickly to their homes. Blu-ray plans start at just $5.99 a month. With Netflix, there are never any due dates or late fees, and shipping is free. You can select from a growing library of titles that can be watched instantly, and a vast array of titles on DVD and Blu-ray. Among the large and expanding base of devices that can stream movies and TV episodes from Netflix right to your TV are Microsoft's Xbox 360 and Sony's PlayStation 3 game console and the Nintendo Wii console. As a Netflix Unlimited member, you get Blu-ray movies by mail in about one business day. As a new member and HD Nation viewer, you can get a free trial membership. Go to www.netflix.com slash HDNation and sign up now. 
Be sure to use this URL so that they know we sent you. Our search for more living room friendly wireless keyboards for the home theater PC continues. We finally scored one of Lenovo's multimedia remote with keyboards. Or what else is it? What do they call it? Lenovo that? mini wireless keyboard. It depends whether you're looking on Lenovo's website or the back of the... Uh, the mini wireless keyboard. Or multimedia mini wireless keyboard. It's a trackball. It's a keyboard. It looks like the little attachment on your vacuum you use to suck things out <laughs> of the corners of the furniture. Uh, multimedia be buttons, beatons. The multimedia buttons are across the top. Very nice. Yeah, actually. It's the same texture as the ThinkPad notebooks oh, on the back. Black rubbery material that's... Doesn't very, pick up very fingerprints. Grippy. Sadly, uh, to the left and right of the trackball, the left and right buttons are covered with shiny black plastic, which does pick up fingerprints in an ugly way. It's not Bluetooth. There's a little tiny 2.4 gigahertz dongle that gets stored in the back right here, which is kind of convenient. It runs off a pair of triple A's. Um, How's set up on that thing? It took about 10 seconds. Literally, you plug the USB dongle in your Windows system, like Windows XP, Vista, Windows 7, um, and it works. Like, it loads the driver automatically. It's a standard USB driver, and it's light, dude. They, they, they measure it out at, like, 107 grams without the batteries. Oh, yeah. But the keys feel really solid. Very Obviously, nice. Good gonna... tactile feedback. It's got the shift keys where I'd want them for doing upper and lower case. Uh, Function key even, which is I don't know. You, you see, I'm thinking I'm comparing it to a mobile phone keypad, right. and it's it's bigger and in my opinion more full featured than that. Well, well, hold it like you would hold it when you were typing, right? So if, totally. if you're used to a hardware keyboard on a phone, it's actually going to be super fast for you because it's going to feel so similar. I got to say, the only thing I don't really like about that, other than the shiny part on the top that picks up thumbprints, because I yeah. hate shiny stuff that picks up fingerprints, is the trackball feels kind of cheap. You you actually heard it. It does rattle a little bit. I can't decide if that's a good thing and it minimizes friction and wear, or if it's, it's a, a bad thing. It's a flickable trackball, so flickable you can track you can ball. move it really fast, but it it doesn't click. And that no. is one thing I would like it to do, like a mouse button, like the main mouse button. It'd be nice to, instead of having to move your thumb off of there to click a response, or if it didn't have quite the flickability, it'd be easier to keep it where you want on screen. So what do you think? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Thumbs up. It's super useful, but I'd say it's not the most ideal remote for Windows Media Center for a couple of reasons. It doesn't have any of the dedicated buttons like the green button that gets you back to the main menu. Navigation, you're essentially left using the arrow keys right. along with the enter button to navigate through things. And you'll end up having to go back to use the trackball itself if you want to just get out of a program or something you're in and have to left click out of it like that. The, the lack of the dedicated buttons right. really kind of nails it for not being the most optimal remote for Windows Media Center, but otherwise, full keypad and a small compact factor. So if you want to do a, a fast email, some some instant messaging, totally light web browsing, search. awesome. Not so good though for Windows Media Center. Check it out, people, if you're looking for. Well, I, just, I guess the the, con, the search continues then. Maybe we need a keyboard that's integrated with a Windows Media Center remote, or maybe you just need to have a Windows Media Center remote and a keyboard. I could. I'll show you what I'm using right now, and it's 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 kind of a compromise, uh, about ten times the size of this, unfortunately. <laughs> so maybe you need that and the Windows Media. This is about as small as you're going to get for for having the features it offers. Good point. Let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, ladies and gentlemen. They're called GameFly. It's the largest online video game rental service. They offer you a choice from over seven thousand new and classic titles across all consoles and handhelds. The plan starting at $15.95 a month. Gamefly members can rent one to four games at a time and get to keep them for as long as you like. No late fees, no due dates, and shipping is always free. When you're done playing a game, send it back and Gamefly will send you the next available game on your list. If you really like the game, you want to keep it forever, click Keep It on the Gamefly website, and the game is yours at a discounted price. Gamefly will even mail you the case and manuals free of charge. Want to score a free two-week trial? Well, if you're an HD Nation fan, go to Gamefly.com slash HD Nation. You can get a free two-week trial. So restrictions to apply, see the site for details, and please support HD Nation by supporting our sponsors like Gamefly. This question comes to us from HD Nation viewer, the Tater Boss, who writes in, <laughs> Pat and Robert, let's assume that we have a 1080p HD screen, maybe 42 inches, it's got a resolution of 1920 by 1080, and it looks great. What happens when you move to a bigger screen while keeping the same resolution? Will 1920 by 1080 start to show pixels at 60 inches or higher? Or is there some magic happening with dots per inch, such as with the new iPhone's 320 plus DPI retina display technology, even better than what the human eye can see, according to Apple? That's marketing fluff. We'll just dismiss that right now. So how do we tell which screen is 1920 by 1080 DPI crap versus 1920 by 1080 retina display quality? What's the optimal size for 1080p resolution? Finally, just for fun, is there a screen size limitation for 1080 HD where the image will not get better but possibly even get worse as the pixels get bigger? Thanks, watching every week, the Tater Boss. 
Well, the short answer is to sit far enough away so that you can't discern the individual pixels of the display and sit close enough to the screen so that remains an, amusive, an immersive viewing experience. Generally speaking though, people tend to buy smaller HD TVs than they probably could for their given, like, you know, you, you, your living room, you're eight or nine feet away from your standard deaf television. You can probably go with a much larger HD TV than you'd think. Provided you have good content. Now, going back to your question, for a fixed screen resolution of 1080p, like you mentioned, we could be talking about an LCD screen or a plasma television. The larger the TV screen size, the larger the individual pixels will be. Now, for example, uh, think projector here. A 100-inch 1080p display may have the pixels the size of dimes, and a 200-inch 1080p display may have the pixels that are the size of quarters. Now, with high-quality 1080p video being displayed on a good 1080p resolution display, they match one-to-one. -one. It's recommended that a 30 to 40 degree horizontal viewing angle uh, be used to you know, keep it immersive yet close enough to the display so you can pick up all the detail but not too far so you're not losing detail because your eyesight can't discern the detail being presented to you. Which gives us an actual way to mathematically compute how far you should be sitting from a, a particular diagonal screen resolution. Totally. The, the SEMTI, the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, they have a good standard. They believe in about a 30 degree horizontal viewing angle and to get that you can multiply the diagonal of the set by about one and a half or maybe slightly more. Now the folks at THX, they prefer to be even more immersive. They want you to sit with a 40 degree horizontal viewing angle and to calculate that you can take that diagonal and multiply it by about 1.2 and that will tell you how far away from the screen you should be sitting to get the optimal you know, distance versus resolution of the display itself. For beautifully rendered 1080p content. For the best, yeah. Now keep in <laughs> mind that optimal picture detail from any display device is a combination of many factors. The quality of the source material, the, the display performance that can include contrast, color, the room environment, how bright or dark it is, and of course a person's eyesight, which people seem to always kind of forget. Uh, basically, if the video content is subpar, sit further back or view it on a smaller screen to make it look better. Likewise, sit closer to the, the display device when viewing high quality source material on a high resolution display. So basically in your ideal, that, that home theater you haven't built yet with the poured concrete sound engineered bunker that's completely dark with the matte black painted walls and the rows of <laughs> tiered theater seating and the carpets uh. on the floor, you would basically sit in the last row for SD content on the screen and the front row for HD content? Very much so. Otherwise, That's you're going to nuts do. looking at all the defects in the upscaled. Yeah, content. or unless I just take my glasses off and make things a little blurrier, <laughs> and then I can sit closer on the standard def content. But I, I, I love a detailed picture, so I will ensure that I am sitting as close as possible. But. You know, not, if it's overwhelming, of course, that's a personal decision. But I want to be able to see everything, and I know about where my eyesight will fall off in relation to that. And you can use those formulas we just mentioned to get a good approximation of where the limits are for 1080p content on a 1080p display. <laughs> Scott writes in, great show. Thanks, Scott. Just moved to my first house, and I want to wire it for surround sound. What's the proper way to run speaker wires and walls? Also, I've seen plenum and in-wall rated cable. What do you use? The house is on a slab, so I'll have to get creative. I also want to run gigabit throughout the house. Thanks, Scott. Okay. First up, you can't run any wires alongside your power lines that are already in the wall, unless, of course, you want to violate lots of really good building codes, potentially burn down your house, no. and most important of all, compromise your audio and video quality, because the power not so good next to the uh, speaker cables. So first, you rip off all the sheetrock on the walls, or if you don't want to do that, cut a slice about six inches wide from behind the HDTV all the way around three sides of the room to where the rear surrounds will be located. Then you get a fancy grill with a 90 degree angle head, and you drill your holes through all the two by fours. Then you you pull cable rated for in-wall and you get it all inspected and you probably should check to see if you actually need a permit for this first in your municipality. You're probably not going to go that route. Just, just saying. It's adding in-wall cable. This is a serious project. Yeah, plenum rated cable is good stuff, at least if you have AC or heating vents near where you want to go or where you want your surrounds to go. Now, plenum rating means that the wire is design designed to run through the HVAC ducting in buildings and it's built in with special plastics to minimize the danger in case of fire. Now, there's nothing worse than HVAC systems in large buildings circulating toxic PVC fumes from non-plenum cable in the case of fire. Right. I mean, plenum cable is basically invented because there's all these old office buildings that don't have any, basically, wire racks designed to, to move your, your telephone wire or your, your, your Ethernet wire around the building. I would just throw out there, if you're, if you're going to go to that trouble to cut the walls like that, 
<laughs> I'm a big fan of conduit, man. If you're remodeling or if you have first access to that wall and you can put conduit in the wall, a tube to right. run that cable through, then you don't have to worry about things like plenum and whatnot. Throw a couple extra Cat5 cables in there just for the heck of it so you can use one to pull the next cable you may need down the road. Uh, that is the joke in installation scenarios. It's like whatever cable you put in there, that will be used to pull the next cable down the line. Yeah, put and two, maybe exactly. four. That's why I put in, a I just buy, a, buy a spool of Cat5 and just leave a line in there just to, if for nothing else, use to pull that next cable. Right. Personally, I'd think about using flat cable under a carpet until you figure out where you want the speakers located or running it through the ceiling if you have access up there. Don't forget, there's often ceiling spaces you can get to if you're willing to crawl to. Check cableorganizer.com. It's an easy way to find PVC surface raceways and quarter duct raceways. They're designed to be mounted down near the floor. It's a thin, long plastic tube with a snap cover. Basically, you stuff your cables inside of it and then you can paint it with the same latex paint you use on the wall so it kind of blends in and disappears. It works best if there's no door on the route. Otherwise, between the receiver and the speakers, you've got to run in like the plastic conduit, the raceway up and around the door and around. Ow. Wiretracks.com sells pretty cool kits. They turn crown molding up at the corners of the ceiling into raceways so you can oh. actually run it up there. So you run a really thin thing up to from your ACTV or your receiver up to the ceiling and that into the crown molding. Along the floor too, maybe yeah. there's some options there as well. So Yeah, the raceways work pretty good if for I that. If I can hide it in the crown molding, I'm all for that. I like that thought. <laughs> Just do yourself a favor. Check with your local building codes first because there's nothing worse than finding out if you burn your house down that maybe they don't have to pay the insurance because you didn't oh. follow code when you were pulling low-voltage wires to your house. That would suck. Revision 3 just celebrated its fifth anniversary with a live dig nation here in San Francisco, California. If you didn't make the show or catch the live stream, you can still relive the fun. Just go to this week's dig nation at revision3.com slash dig nation. Hey, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode of HD Nation. As always, we want to know what you think, so send your comments, questions, or suggestions to hdnation at revision3.com. Do it. Be sure to check out the forums. You can chat with other fans of the show at revision3.com slash forum, and you can find links regarding everything we've talked about today right there on the show page in the show notes at hdnation.tv. Plus, you'll find all the links to subscribe to the show, so subscribe and watch, and until next time. Thanks for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. We'll see you next week.